So I'm gonna give you a brief overview of what program verification is about, and as Martin already suggested, I'm gonna give you uh, also an overview of an application of program verification uh, in the area of uh, networking. So let me motivate my talk with a little example. So the device you see on the slide here is a so-called Zune. Zune was Microsoft's attempt to build a music player like Apple's iPod, and um, the Zune device got, had an issue, uh, namely on the uh, 31st of December 2008, on New Year's Eve, all devices uh, of the Zune froze and didn't work anymore until they were rebooted on January 1st, 2009, and then they worked again. And uh, figuring out why uh, the Zoom device stopped working on New Year's Eve is actually uh, an in interesting example uh, and a nice use case for program verification. So here's the piece of code that caused the problem. So the Zoom stores today's state as a number which counts a number of days since January 1st, 1980. And then it has a function, so here a C function, that takes a number, sorry, wrong button, that takes a number of days and converts it into today's state. So what it does is it repeatedly subtracts 365 from days and increments the variable year by one. So that means you loop until you have fewer than 365 days left and then you move on and you compute the month and the day and so on, okay? But of course in this computation you also have to take leap years into account. That's why the code looks a bit more complicated. So what we do here is we say, well, as long as we have more than 365 days, we continue. We check whether the current year is a leap year. If so, we check whether we have even more than 366 days left, because obviously a leap year has 366 days. In that case, we subtract 366 and increment the year. And otherwise, here we subtract 365 and increment the year. And now some of you might already spot the bug if the variable days is exactly 366, then this loop is not gonna terminate, right? Because this condition is true, and now if we have a leap year, we go into this if branch, but if days is equal to 366, then this condition is false. Uh, there's no else branch for this if statement, so we just loop around the while statement, and we continue forever. And this is why the problem showed up on New Year's Eve 2008, because 2008 is a leap year, and it had to be the last day of the year. And therefore, the fix was, well, reboot the next day, and then the Zoom would work again for the next four years. So I think this is a really uh, uh, nice example uh, of a software bug. But you see, in general, what the problem is, right? So we have very effective today, uh, techniques today to, uh, to test software in all kinds of ways, manually, automatically, using fuzzing. Uh, most companies do code reviews, and all of these techniques are very important and useful, but they are not quite sufficient to really make sure that software doesn't have bugs and maybe even security vulnerabilities. So if you wanna go beyond the quality level that you can achieve by testing and reviews, we need stronger techniques than that. And this problem is amplified by modern trends in computer science in general. So the way we build software goes more and more in a direction where the software has an immense number of possible executions that cannot really be covered by testing uh, effect <coughs> effectively because, for instance, you have more and more concurrency, you have distribution, you execute on weak memory models for maybe software and mobile devices. You have lots of different interactions with an environment, with sensors. So there's so many different ways in which you can execute a program such that testing usually covers only a tiny fraction of the possible executions. So now program verification is an attempt to complement testing and reviews. I'm not saying to replace, I said to complement testing and reviewing uh, by having an additional technique that lets you give very strong guarantees about the software you're building. So the basic idea of program verification is that you have two inputs. You have the program itself, which is in a sense a description of how you want to compute something. What is your algorithm step by step? And you have a specification that describes what are the properties that you would like to check. And then you feed those two things into a program verification tool, hopefully an automated one, and the verification tool will then either say okay, the software has the specified properties, or it will come back with an error message, and hopefully this error message has enough content such that you can understand the error and go ahead and fix it. And program verification can be applied to a very wide uh, range of techniques, so standard targets are uh, memory safety or in general crash freedom. Um, 
in concurrent programs, data race freedom and deadlock freedom. You might want to uh, prove termination, like in the Zoom example. You might want to prove functional correctness. Does the program really compute the right kinds of values or various security properties? And the big advantage of program verification compared to other techniques is that it can give you extremely strong guarantees. So you do not just run the program on a handful of tests, but instead you can give a proof, a mathematical proof, that the program satisfies the spec for all possible inputs, or if it's a concurrent program for all possible threat schedules, or for all possible interactions with the environment. And the last point is in particularly, it's particularly important if you're interested in security, because the environment contains the potential attacker, so you can verify it once you've defined an attacker model that the program is going to be secure for all possible behaviors of this attacker. So let me show you what that feels like and looks like in practice. So uh, here's a program verifier that we've built in my group uh, for the Go programming language. Uh, it's integrated into Visual Studio Code so that you have an IDE support. And the example is a Go version of the code that I just showed you uh, for the Zoom uh, bug. So I have a function up here that tells me whether a given year is a leap year, yes or no. And then I have a function convert days, which is exactly the same logic that you've seen on the slide. And now you might see at the bottom here that we have a green message here that verification succeeded. So what that means is that the verifier checks by default that the program is memory safe and doesn't crash. So apparently that's the property that it was already a be able to check. And let me show you that this is actually for real. So for instance, if I go to this uh, computation of whether a year is a leap year, and I just introduce an error by computing the year modulo zero instead of modulo four, which of course doesn't make any sense. But then what we're essentially doing is a division by zero here, right? So I get an error message back immediately. And if I can, if I hover with the mouse over the error message, then it tells me here the divisor here might be zero. Well, it's actually zero, but uh, the messages are phrased very carefully, so it tells me that it might be zero. And so what happened here is I did not run the program. I didn't even compile the program, right? There's no main function, nothing. I also didn't write a single test case. What happened is while I wrote the program, in the background, a verifier tries to construct a proof that this program cannot crash, the construction of that proof failed, and the failed proof can be mapped back to an error message, which I then report in the IDE. So let me fix that by, uh, by defining the leap year again, and see it takes a second or so, and then the program verifies. So now, of course, the Zoom bug was not about crashing. It was about termination. Termination is not a property we check by default, because, well, many programs are not supposed to terminate, say, a server or a browser or something like that. So if you want to tell the tool that you want to prove termination, you need to write a specification. And so the way we do this is I could write on the function here, the keyword decreases. I will explain in a moment why it's called decreases. And that instructs the verifier to try to prove termination, which fails here. Uh, so it, it marks the entire loop with squiggly lines here because it says, well, there's a loop here within a function that is supposed to terminate, and who knows whether this loop terminates. So I need to tell the verifier that I also want this loop to terminate, and the way I do this is I give it an expression that is always evaluating to a natural number and that is decreasing in every loop iteration. So imagine you have a number that is always greater or equal zero, and if it's decreasing in every single iteration, that means the loop cannot go on forever, because otherwise the number would at some point become negative, right? So that's what the verifier needs in order to attempt a termination proof. And now when I do this, I get an error message here saying that uh, the, loop, uh, the loop here, forget about this, this is a bug, the loop might not terminate. The termination measure that I gave here might not actually decrease. Yeah, and guess what? Of course, the verifier is right, right? Because we saw that the loop actually has a bug, and we detect it this way. So now I can fix this. Well, what we really need to do is we need to say, well, we definitely want to iterate as long as days is greater than 366, but we also want to, sorry, we also want to um, keep, keep iterating. Sorry, something happened to my keyboard. That's weird. Okay, let me go back to the German keyboard layout. Yeah, now it works. But we also want to iterate if it's not a leap year. 
and moreover, the ACE is greater than 365. And now that's the, the right way of specifying uh, the condition for this uh, loop in the Zoom code. And now you see that the verifier comes back and says this succeeded. And uh, so now because I have this decreases annotation here, I, it has also proved that the code actually terminates. And if I wanted to prove more properties, I can just write more specifications. So for instance, here I can write a so-called post condition. So I can give a guarantee to the callers of the function and I can say, well, the result is always going to be at most 366. And now if I write this, the verifier kicks in again and proves this. Again, if I make a mistake here, if I write, for instance, a strictly smaller instead of a less equal, again, the verifier will kick in and slap me and say, no, no, this is not true. You better fix the code or maybe you fix the specification. So in this little demo, you basically saw what the, what the vision behind this kind of program verification is. The idea is to have a tool that looks over the shoulder of the programmer and tries to find errors while the programmer writes the program. So it, the interaction is pretty much like with a compiler, but the compiler finds syntax errors and type errors, and the verifier finds much deeper semantic errors. And another aspect of this vision is that the programmer has control over how much verification work is actually being done by writing specifications. By default, we check memory safety and crash freedom, and if you want to prove stronger properties, you can enable that by writing specifications uh, in the form of these decreases clauses or insurance clauses that I put into the code there. So let me tell you a little bit about how we actually build such verifiers, what the architecture looks like. So the overall task when you build a verifier is you take as input a program in a programming language, including the annotations that express the specification, and ultimately you need to build this verification tool that tells you yes or no. And in order to do that, there are actually quite a few steps along the way. So typically when you build a verifier, you need to represent the programming language semantics somehow. You must know what does it mean to write a piece of code in this language. You usually perform all kinds of program transformations to simplify the verification effort. You need often quite sophisticated proof search algorithms that try to construct this mathematical proof automatically under the hood. You then need to generate actual proof obligations in, in a logic, and then you hand them off to a so-called SMT solver, which uh, Laurent also mentioned in his previous talk, which does the automatic proving. Uh, and very importantly, when the proving fails, then you would like to produce proper error messages and, uh, and hide all the complexity underneath from the programmer and explain what's wrong in terms of the program. And now a big problem is if you do this professionally like I do, then you want to build very, very <coughs> many different verifiers for different programming languages. But every time you have this entire effort again, right? all these tasks you need to do over and over again for every verifier that you're building. So therefore the community has started to move to a different architecture, which is very much inspired by the architecture we use for compilers. So what we do these days is we use a so-called intermediate verification language. So this is like the intermediate language in a compiler, but whereas the intermediate language of a compiler is designed to simplify optimization and code generation, the intermediate language of a verifier is designed to easily express all kinds of verification problems in a, in a useful way. And now once you have that, then you can actually build a verifier for a given programming language by writing a so-called front-end, which encodes the verification problem of the source language, in my example, Go, into this intermediate language. And now the big advantage is, is if you build various verifiers, you can reuse the intermediate language and you can reuse all the technology you have in the back to actually construct the proof. And all you need to do is you need to build different front-ends for the different programming languages. So that means representing the language semantics. Of course, that's something we need to do for every new verifier. There's no way around that. But all this sophisticated technology under the hood that actually constructs the proofs and provides the error reporting and so on, all of that can be reused between different tools, which makes it much, much easier to build such tools. So it speeds up the development of new verifiers. And for a researcher, it makes it much simpler to experiment with new kinds of approaches and to build uh, prototypes. So in my group in Zurich, we have worked for many, many years on such an intermediate verification system. It's called Viper. 
And uh, Viper consists of an intermediate language, um, which is especially good for verifying imperative uh, code, so heap manipulating programs and concurrent programs. That's where it really shines, because it has support for a logic called separation logic, which is particularly useful for these kinds of programs. And then we have actually two verifiers in the bag, one that is uh, based on a form of symbolic execution and one that is based on a form of verification condition generation. And both of them use an SMT solver underneath in order to um, automate the proof search. And now on top of this wipe, actually, quite a few verifiers have been built. So in my group, we have been working on a verifier for the Rust language called Prusty, where we try to leverage the very strong and sophisticated type system that Rust has to simplify proofs, which is uh, uh, actually quite nice. Uh, we have a verifier for Python, where we mostly explore how we can actually do proofs at compile time about a very dynamic programming language uh, like Python. We have built a verifier for Go. That's the one that you just saw a moment ago in my demo. And we have built various prototypes for other languages, like for Ethereum smart contracts, for instance, uh, for uh, C11 with weak memory underneath. So we use this a lot to also build kind of smaller tools to play around with ideas. And Viper has also been used uh, outside ETH, so people in the Netherlands have built verifiers for Java and OpenCL based on Viper. Uh, the Definity company um, is currently using it to build a verifier for their Motoko smart contract language. Uh, at CMU, they're using it for so-called gradual verification, where you try to stepwisely introduce verification into a development process. So this is a fairly mature architecture, and if you're interested in playing around with, um, with verification, I would recommend that you check it out. Um, uh, as also my colleagues mentioned, of course, all the tools, all the developments are open source. If you're interested in using them or contributing, feel free and, uh, and go there. So what I'm going to do in the second half of my talk is I'm going to tell you a little bit about uh, a practical application of the idea of verification and in particular of the tools that I described here. Uh, what we're trying to address in this, in this project is to prove the correctness and security of a new kind of internet architecture. So this architecture is called Cyan. It has been developed by a colleague of mine at ETH called Adrian Perrick. Uh, he has worked on this for over 10 years, and the idea is really to build the next generation internet. So what if we didn't have to live with a legacy internet, but we build a new internet uh, based on modern technology such that it's highly secure and highly available? So Cyan has a number of nice properties that we don't have in today's internet. So for instance, the sender of every packet can choose the path on which the packet will go from the source to the destination. And that allows you to, for instance, do things like path control. If you want to, for instance, make sure that your data stays within Bulgaria or doesn't leave Europe or doesn't go through a country that you don't like, then uh, Cyan will guarantee that because you have control over the path you're using. Or you can also use multiple paths at the same time, which gives you a nice ways of optimizing traffic and also gives you extremely fast failovers uh, when connections go down. Um, and you also have a certain uh, degree of... Uh, of DDoS protection built into the protocol, which can be kind of nice. And of course, when you first hear about the idea, you think, well, replacing the internet is, is a crazy idea, right? The internet is everywhere. We cannot just shut the old one down and, and build a new one. But actually, there's a lot of hope that the world is actually slowly transitioning towards a better technology. So first of all, Cyan does interoperate with today's internet. And second, there are already quite a few deployments out there. So there's a worldwide research uh, deployment of Cyan and there are also uh, commercial deployments in quite a few countries, so in Switzerland, in Luxembourg, in Belgium, in Korea, in, in Singapore. So there are lots of countries where you all can already use um, this Cyan um, technology for, um, for your commercial traffic. It's overall a quite complex system, so we estimated that it took roughly 150 person years to develop it. Uh, and there are also multiple extensions of the core system, which are all described in, in the book that came out a couple of months ago. So what we are trying to do here is, uh, I did not develop Cyan, right? As I mentioned, this was my colleague, Adrian Perrick. So what, what we are doing is we are trying to verify that Cyan is actually correct and secure. And so for that, we need to first understand what are the properties that one would like to check about such a system. And, and it's very important to understand that they're really properties on two kind of levels. There are properties that are guaranteed by the protocol. 
the protocol itself should give you certain guarantees. Like, for instance, probably the most important one is the second one on my slide here, path or the authorization. So the packet will only travel along previously authorized paths. In other words, if you don't want your packet to go through country X, it will definitely not go through country X. Okay? That's a protocol property and should be verified on the level of the protocol. But then there are also many code level properties because even if the protocol is correct, it might be implemented incorrectly. So the code that's running on a router, for instance, might be buggy, and therefore even if the protocol is designed correctly, uh, bad things might happen. So on the code level, we want to prove certainly that you cannot create uh, runtime errors, which would, for instance, allow you to bring down the system uh, in a denial of service attack. You want correctness so that the routers should actually implement the protocol correctly. You want progress, so all the I.O. operations that a router should perform will actually perform, and they will not just, for instance, forget to forward packets. And you want security properties like secure information flow. For instance, the code does not leak crypto keys and other secret information. So that's the scope of our project. And the way we do this is, in a sense, in a two-layered approach. So on the upper layer here, you see what we do to verify the uh, Cyan protocols. And on the lower layer, you see what we do on the code level. On the protocol level, so this is mostly work by the group of David Basin at ETH, uh, whom we are collaborating with. So they are building a mathematical model of the entire Cyan network. So they describe what components are there, what kind of servers, what kind of routers, what properties do they have, what kind of protocols do they run and they prove all the protocol level properties on the basis of this mathematical model. So that's a model that is written in, um, in a tool called Isabel. So all of these proofs are checked by a tool and can be, uh, can be certified independently uh, if you really want to kind of trust in them. And so once you have the verification of the protocol, you know that the protocols have the desirable properties then what we do is we map this high-level specification of the entire system down to a specification of the code. Right? So earlier in my demo, I showed you that you need to put annotations in the code, maybe a post condition or a decreases clause. Well, these specifications come from the high-level model of the protocol. And we actually have a proof that was uh, quite a bit of work, a proof that shows that the specifications we use on the code level are actually equivalent to the high-level model of the protocol for which we proved security. And once we have a specification on the code level, now we can just take the implementation of the, of the router and verify it against the specification, just like I verified the code from the Zoom example a couple of minutes ago. So to give you a bit more detail about this, uh, about this code level aspect, so um, we are focusing on the open source implementation of Cyan. That's uh, roughly uh, 35,000 lines of code. And currently we focus on the router, which runs a little less than 7,000 lines of code. And this is really important because the way Cyan is constructed, um, that leads to the fact that the code that's running on a router is relatively simple. And only because of that, it's even feasible to do verification. So if you look at a Cisco router for today's internet, a Cisco router runs roughly a million lines of C code. So this is totally out of scope for the kinds of verification techniques we have today. But in a, uh, but in a science system, the router is a much simpler component, so we can actually uh, implement that in, in um, much fewer code, and it becomes feasible to do verification. And this is something we observe often, and also colleagues observe often. If you want to have projects that are fully verified, you have to design them with verification in mind, because you need to kind of make sure they are simple enough and well-structured enough such that verification can actually succeed. So we are focusing on this router, uh, and we are also verifying the router together with Cyan libraries. Um, so far, we focus on safety, functional correctness, and progress. We have not proved secure information flow yet, but we will be doing that. And of course, I also need to be uh, clear about things we are not verifying. So we are, uh, we are not verifying, therefore we are trusting other external libraries, in particular, for instance, the crypto library that is used underneath. Uh, we trust the Go standard libraries, and we also trust the Go compiler and the operating system. So if there were bugs in those components, we would not detect them during our verification effort, um, but we do verify the green parts here on my slide. So let me quickly summarize where we are in this effort. 
So on the uh, protocol level, on the higher level, we've verified uh, the data plane protocols. And by we, again, I mean the group of David Basin at ETH. Uh, so they have proved correctness and security of packet forwarding in the presence of a rather strong attacker model. Okay, so we can actually demonstrate mathematically that Cyan really has the intended correctness and security properties. On the code level, we have so far verified roughly 3,500 lines of code of the router. Uh, so that's about half of the, of the size of the router, as you just saw, uh, where we have memory safety, functional correctness, and termination proofs. And our preliminary results are actually very interesting. So first of all, developing this f these formal models really provided a deeper understanding of this entire architecture, not only for the people who did the verification, but also for the engineers who designed it initially, because there was lots of communication going back and forth to really clarify many small aspects and corner cases of the system, because in a mathematical model, you need to get all of those right. So we really deepened our understanding uh, of science itself. Uh, we did identify and fix various errors, both on the protocol level and on the code level. Of course, mistakes do happen, uh, and we found those during verification and were able to fix them. And I would like to emphasize there were some errors on the code level, not too many, but some, even though we have rather extensive reviewing, testing, uh, and also fuzzing. And one perspective that I'm particularly excited about is that we are currently introducing verification into the continuous integration. So that means Every night when the Cyan router software is built, the verifier is run in the continuous integration. In the verification breaks, the engineers will get an error message and they need to fix the code or need to adapt the specification to make sure that the code stays in this verified state. So I think this is, at least as far as I know, the first time that actually um, verification is then performed by the actual engineers and not by verification experts. So we are still pretty much at the beginning of this uh, last point here. Uh, but we are moving in this direction, um, and I'm super curious to see how this is going to work out. So let me summarize what I presented so far. So I tried to make the point that program verification is a way to give very strong guarantees about a wide variety of properties uh, for software, in principle also for hardware, but that's not what I'm doing, so I'm looking into software, and so, um, so that makes it interesting. I also made the case that when you build a verifier, it's really good to have an intermediate verification language so that you can reuse a lot of the effort you need to put especially into the automation of proofs. And we have this wiper system that allows you to build verifiers for all kinds of concurrent and uh, heap manipulating programming languages, um, as for instance we have shown in the, in the Rust, Go, Java, and, uh, and Python verifiers. And finally, I've shown you that we can use that also in fairly large projects like the Cyan Internet Architecture, where we've already verified a substantial amount of code against a mathematical high-level specification of the protocol. So now in my talk so far, I emphasized uh, the highlights and the achievements we've had so far. Let me conclude by giving you an overview of the open challenges, because there are many, and I know that some of you are interested in in maybe doing research in this field or in considering a PhD in this area. Uh, so here are some of the topics that you might want to consider to work on. And basically, when you do verification for real, if you apply it to, to real systems written in real languages, then you see issues all over the place, right? There are still lots and lots of challenges on all kinds of levels. So definitely challenges for the theory itself, like developing program logics for various uh, features of programming languages, for instance figuring out what the precise formal semantics of such intermediate verification languages should be. Um, certifying the verifier. So what if the verifier has a bug? Can we somehow independently produce some kind of evidence that the verifier actually produced the right result and didn't make a mistake itself? And so these are all topics that still require new theory. We also need uh, new verification techniques, mostly to prove even more advanced properties of programs, but also advanced language features. There is still a whole bunch of, of commonly used features out there where nobody really knows how to reason about them, so there's a lot of work to be done. And those apply especially to concurrent and distributed systems, which still pose many interesting challenges. On the tool side, uh, research is mostly about uh, increasing automation and reducing the annotation overhead and also to improve error reporting. So what we see when we work with practitioners, 
they are typically able uh, to use our verifiers and to also write the specification. So as long as verification succeeds, things go OK. But when verification fails, then they start being really overwhelmed by, well, what should I do now? Should I, should I change the code? Should I change the spec? Do I need more annotations to convince the tool? So in the area, area of error reporting, there's a lot of work that can be done to make verification more usable. And finally, when you look at applications, um, our, all our verifiers are modular. So that means we verify one method at a time. Uh, and that makes it relatively scalable. But still, scaling up to thousands of lines of codes um, has all kinds of challenges that one could address. Um, what I mean here by proof engineering is we have this notion of software engineering, right, which describes how we go from small pieces of code to large systems and what are the processes. And I believe now that, now that so many people are using verification on a larger scale, for instance, at Amazon and other companies, we need something similar for verification. So how do we maintain large verification projects? How do we avoid that we need to re-verify everything as the code evolves? Uh, how do we even get an overview of what has been achieved in the verification so far? So there's a lot of work to be done more on the engineering side. And finally, I believe that verification alone will not be able to answer all the questions we have about software. So we want a tight integration with other techniques, such as testing, fuzzing, static analysis, um, and still be able to give precise guarantees about what has been achieved with the combination of tools. So you see there's a lot of things still to work on. And if you're interested in discussing any of these, um, feel free to talk to me. I'm going to be around for the next couple of hours. And uh, with that, I conclude, and uh, thank you very much.